God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of mine. Well, God is good all the time. Through that darkest night, His light will shine. Well, God is good. God is good all the time. There we go. God is good all the time. Put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good all the time. To that darkest night, this light will shine. God is good. God is good. All the time, yes, he is. If you're walking through that valley and there are shadows all around, do not fear, he will guide you, he will keep you safe and sound. He has promised to never leave you or forsake you, and his word is true. God is good. All the time, put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good all the time. Through that darkest night, His light will shine. God is good. God is good all the time. Yes, He is. We were sinners, so unworthy. Still, for us, He chose to die. He filled us with His Holy Spirit. Now we can stand and testify that His love is everlasting, and His mercies they will never end. God is good. Come on, all the time He put us on a bridge in this heart of mine. God is good all the time. Through that darkest night, His light will shine. God is good. God is good all the time. Yes, He is. Hello, good morning, and welcome to another episode of Catholics at Home podcast. I'm JP, and I hope all of you are keeping well. Just right now, we had the video of Don Moen, God is Good, and I hope all of you are keeping well, healthy, God is good, and I hope he's keeping you safe and sound wherever you are tuning in to watch this program this Saturday. Uh, this Saturday's program is actually at 11.30 instead of the usual 10.30, and shortly, you'll be getting Father to join us to tell us a little bit about why today's show is at 11.30. But if this is your first time tuning into the program, we invite you to like, share, and subscribe to Catholics at Home. Tell us where you're watching us from, or even better, host a viewing party with your friends and family uh, for this show. So this week, we are going to talk a little bit about where are we now in terms of the pandemic? Uh, you know, are we ready to move into endemic? And we have a very special guest joining us this morning, Professor Dr. Dr. Adiba Kamal Zulzaman, our Malaysian foremost infectious disease expert. So with a high vaccination rate amongst you know, adults and the increased inoculation, especially with the younger population and the better managed infection situation in the country, a lot has been discussed about Malaysia moving forward 
to becoming an endemic state of COVID-19. So how do we transition safely and how do we coexist with the virus in the future? So Professor Adiba will be joining us shortly to talk about this. But before that, I would like to bring on our resident padre, Father Clarence Devadas. Hi, good morning, JP. Good morning, Hi, everyone. Father. Morning. <laughs> wow, you're looking bright and colorful this morning, JP. Yes, I'm ready for Chinese <laughs> New Year. Sure. And I can see that we've got comments from our viewers wishing us a really Gongsi Fata Happy New Year. <laughs> Yeah, how are you, are you, are you doing, Father? Hi, I'm JP. Getting ready. I just jumped out of a a, a wedding mass. Literally, have to leave leave the couple at the, at the altar and 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 come join join this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but we are so glad that you can make it, even though it's it's at eleven thirty. But we are very happy to have you on this yeah, program. It's Father. it's okay. The priest to leave the, the couple at the altar and not the bride or the bridegroom to leave <laughs> each one at the altar and run away. Yeah. Yes, indeed. And on this note, congratulations to the wedding couple. You know, Father Clarence did not mean what he said, uh, but very big heartiest congratulations to, to the both of you. Yeah. So, Father, we, we've got a very interesting topic today. We're going to talk a bit about endemic, pandemic. I, I, I myself am very confused with the whole term, you know, what is pandemic, uh, epidemic and all of this. So I think we are in very good hands this morning, right? Because we, we have yeah, a, definitely, a special I mean, guest you- if there's anyone who is a specialist in this area, is our guest this morning. Uh, and we are so privileged uh, and the honour is yes, certainly yes. ours for her to, to take time off from her, I'm sure her, her, her practically uh, uh, tight schedule to be with us here this morning. So let's let's bring her in uh, to have this conversation with us and to enlighten our viewers this morning. Because we've been hearing already uh, endemic now. Well, how is that going to be different? I'm myself a bit confused. Yeah. Let's bring on our guest for this morning, Professor Adiba. Good morning. Good morning, Father. Good morning. Hi, good morning, Prof. Morning. Good. Welcome to Catholic morning, at Home. Prof. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, like I said, it, the pleasure is all ours. Uh, I know you have a very busy schedule. You have your, your hands everywhere. And you, <laughs> you kind of said to me the other day, there's, you, you quoted from the Bible, that there's no, re- that there's no rest for the, for the wicked. Uh, <laughs> But I'm sure you're very passionate about what you do, so that's why you kind of spread yourself all over. And the honor is ours to have you here this morning. Yeah. So, so Professor, you know, just just right off, I, I can see that you know uh, you were recently awarded the top 50 women in Asia 2022 list by Forbes magazine, and in 2021 you were appointed as a member of the World Health Organization Science Council, and and you know this is actually a group that advises the world on scientific and technological advances impacting public health globally. And so it, it is indeed our honor to have you on our podcast. I mean, you're known locally and internationally as the eminent infectious disease specialist, but perhaps, you know, for our viewers and even for me, you could tell us a little bit of how that come to be. Thanks, JP. And, and once again, Father, thank you for having me. Well, I, I trained as an infectious disease physician in Melbourne, and when I returned, um, infectious disease in Malaysia, this was in 1997, uh, infectious diseases wasn't uh, a specialist and wasn't really, it was just starting as, as a specialist entity because, you know, infectious disease is so common in Malaysia and most general physicians would manage uh, their own. But with the arrival of HIV AIDS, there was a real need for um, people to specialize in it, much like, you know, cardiologists specialize in the heart and, you know, uh, neurologists, the brain, etc. So I set up the infectious disease unit at UMMC to look after largely patients with, with HIV, but that's not the only thing. We look after patients with dengue, with TB, and now more and more uh, looking basically after the whole hospital with um, problems around antibiotic resistance, hospital infections, and so forth. You might have heard that last week there was a very important paper saying that more people die of antibiotic resistance than of HIV and TB um, in in the last few years. So um, from looking after patients, it became clear to me back in the late 1990s here in Malaysia that unless we do something about prevention, we're not going to, you know, have good control of the HIV um, epidemic. And so um, at the time, most of those who were getting infected were people who use drugs. Um, and with my background in Australia, where they had the harm reduction program, the needle syringe program and methadone. Um, And then I really didn't see anyone in Australia who uh, were living with HIV who who 
acquired the infection from injecting drug use. And I thought this is something that we must do because we were starting to see between five to 6,000 new infections a year in the late 1990s. And I was very naive in those days, I guess. I still am. And I thought, oh, this shouldn't be too difficult. Oh, my. <laughs> because, you know, drug use is criminalized. It's so stigmatized and so forth. Um, I managed to get a grant from the US and put together some, some research findings and use that to advocate to the you know the stakeholders, ADK, et cetera, et cetera, and didn't really get very far until I made the right connections with politicians who became worried. Uh, and it was also around the time of the Millennium Development Goal review period, and we clearly didn't achieve um, control of HIV and TB. And I think for the government, that was the impetus to um, to allow for a pilot program. And, and so we, working with the Malaysian AIDS Council, at the time I was president of the Malaysian AIDS Council, we implemented it together with Ministry of Health. And uh, now, this was in 2005. Now, um, what, 17 years later, we've really turned the HIV epidemic amongst people who inject drugs around. Now we're only seeing between two to 300 cases a year. And we did a review of a return on investment in this program and showed that just in the first seven years of, of uh, implementing the program, we probably uh, prevented around 15,000 new infections and saved the government millions of ringgit in in, do, in treatment costs alone. <clears throat> so I think that caught the eye of the regional and international world um, because, you know, Malaysia is otherwise known for being very harsh with uh, people who inject drugs and, you know, we still have the death penalty and so forth. And slowly but surely I got invited to be on, on um, committees and, and things like that. And, and the culmination is, I guess, the presidency of the International AIDS Society, which is a very, very large society with about 18,000 um, members in 162 countries. And it really, I guess, is the pinnacle of my career because previous presidents of IAS include Francoise Barry Sanusi, only two to three presidency ago, and she discovered the virus and is a Nobel Prize winner, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, you don't get elected into the IS unless a uh, presidency, you know, it's it's a really prestigious um, uh, position. So, and, and it, you know, because as, as I was saying before the conference, um, um, we host this large conference every year, and this year we hope to host it in Montreal. And normally uh, we would get minimum of 15,000 people. We would get the likes of Dr. Anthony Fauci, lead, world leaders, and, and Bill Gates, and all of that. So it's a very high profile uh, position. So enough about talking about me. <laughs> no, prof, prof, you, you, like, like, well, yeah, that's that's a, also really prestigious. There's only nine of us on that, and two people, two of them are Nobel Prize winners. Um, the, the chair is a Nobel Prize winner as well. Like you said, Prof, when you came back from Australia, you were focused on on TB and and drug related infections. Uh, I, I'm sure you you never expected uh, COVID. In kind of a, a pandemic and during this time i mean uh we've been I, I guess we've been using words like pandemic and now there's this endemic or epidemic so just to help our user uh, viewers understand well what's the difference between a pandemic endemic or epidemic or if there's <laughs> anything else <laughs> uh, um, medical school uh, lecture so let's take a few steps back. Um, when we talk about um, infections that, that um, uh, you know, are, are causing a problem, the first, the smallest uh, component of it would be an outbreak. So um, you hear about, say, cholera outbreak. So normally an outbreak is when the disease is not usually uh, present in the community and then suddenly you get one, two, three, um, uh, outbreaks, uh, I mean, cases, and then depending on, on the disease, then you declare an outbreak. We had, we recently had, well, I guess it didn't become an outbreak, the cholera, thankfully, um, but 
we've we've had the Nipah outbreak, for instance, that we were involved in as well, um, and then that got contained. So that that's an outbreak when you have sudden increase in number of infections in a given community. The next level would be um, an epidemic. So if that outbreak becomes very large and involves more than one community, you would call that an, an epidemic. Um, so annually, I guess you get an epidemic of influenza when you, maybe not here in Malaysia, but uh, uh, you know, in, in, in temperate climates, you will get winter epidemics of, of influenza. So when you get many more cases involving more than just one community. A pandemic is of course a much larger, larger epidemic when it's gone global, right? So an endemic situation is when that pandemic or epidemic then kind of settles to a um, constant that um, it's always present, but uh, not in huge numbers, and, and it's it's constant, um, and it hasn't gone away. So classic examples would be dengue in, in Malaysia, tuberculosis are endemic. Um, uh, it, it doesn't mean that it's not serious because, you know, people die from TB, people still die from dengue, but it's it's a con you know it's a constant presence and every now and again that endemicity can lead to outbreaks for instance you might sometimes get outbreak of dengue in a particular suburb or, or area or outbreak of tb in prisons for instance so those are the um, epidemiological terms that actually you know are attached to it um, meanings yeah Oh, thank you for breaking it down so simply. You know, yeah. We use this, these terms and sometimes we use it you know, synonymously and we just listen Correct. and we, we think that they are the same. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a nice way of an outbreak and, and endemic, a pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I'm actually just taking down notes and I, and I remember, you know, the only time I use outbreak is when I have an acne on my face and then it becomes an outbreak. <laughs> so I, wrong choice of word to use. But, you know, coming back to yeah, this... No, prof, that's, that's, yeah. that's for, for that condition, it's fine as well. <laughs> Good to know that I'm using the right term, Prof. But, you know, I'm just referring to the latest parliamentary special selected uh, select committee report. Um, and they've actually concluded that Malaysia is not prepared to fully transition into an endemic phase. Um, and like what you've actually mentioned, that means we've kind of, you know, become harmoniously together with with the with the particular virus. In this case, it's COVID nineteen. So why is our country now discussing moving into an endemic state? And I remember when we first started out with COVID nineteen in Malaysia, and we were doing the rollout of the vaccination. One of the buzzwords that we were hearing uh, ministers talking about was let's achieve a herd immunity but now we've not even talked about herd immunity we now have gone into discussing about endemic state and this report says that we're not ready for it so tell us a little bit more i mean can you help us break it down just yeah. for our viewers to understand sure sure okay let me first of all explain herd immunity and again this is a very specific uh epidemiological term that that means um you know, what, and what it means is when you have had enough, a high enough level of immunity, whether it's natural immunity from a natural infection or uh, a wide coverage of vaccination, that the virus has no, uh, is no longer able to find people it can cause infections and it will slowly go away. Now, we know that, that, that this is probably not going to happen with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and particularly since the emergence of Omicron, because it is uh, highly infectious, um, number one. And number two, because it can, again, using fancy medical terms, evade immunity, meaning you, you may have had natural immunity or you may have, had, you may have been infected been vaccinated but you can still get infected so meaning uh, the, the infection is not going to go away but what we hope to achieve is that you know you will just get mild disease and not severe disease so that's the entire well almost the entire premise of the vaccine program that you know 
the virus can no longer make you very sick or land you in hospital, of course, worst of all, uh, kill you. So because it remains highly infectious and because you can um, still develop the disease despite having had previous infection or, um, uh, or, or have been vaccinated even with a booster, uh, you can still get infected. That means the virus is not going to go away. So herd, Im herd immunity is going to be difficult to achieve. I see. And, and you know, just talking about that herd immunity, so we are done discussing about going to an endemic state. Mm -hmm. And what is your take about, you know, the report that says that we are not ready for that? Um, were were there the, any, yeah. Yeah, I think the report was from some months ago. Um, you know, before we, we knew enough or understood enough about what was happening with um, the, the variants, the Omicron. Well, I think, first of all, um, we learned a lot, or we should have learned a lot from the Delta search. Uh, we should have been able to do a, a gaps analysis of what went wrong. Um, you know, at, at its peak, we were seeing, what, 20,000 new cases a day uh, of, of the Delta uh, search, and no doubt, most countries would, you know, even even developed countries were having trouble um, uh, responding to to the Delta surge. But I think, you know, we in this in in Malaysia had a very high level of high rate of infection per population, and also high rates of death per population. And uh, from my own observation, I think there were several reasons for this. Number one was our public health system became completely overwhelmed. And these are the people at the, you know, the clinic kesihatan, what we call the PKDs, who, who um, are your point of contact when you become positive. They call you, they do the contact tracing, they tell you to isolate, they put on your galang, all that. Now, these people, this team were, uh, was, was completely overwhelmed with the number of cases and therefore, you were not, and, and it's no fault of theirs, right? They then should, should have been, a, you know, a search of people uh, helping them more importantly, the whole thing should have been, I mean, you know, it's easy to say in hindsight that we desperately need digitization because everything was done manually. And therefore there was a, a lag from the time, I think some of you may have experienced it, from the time you were infected to the time you were told to go into isolation and we were not able to break the chain. So, so that's the number one reason why we saw so many cases because contact tracing just became impossible. Yeah. Number two, I think the the on the clinical side, you know, as the cases became overwhelmed, people were not able to be monitored adequately or told to go into hospital early enough. And so we, we had cases presenting to us really late. Um, and although by then we already know what, what the best form of treatment is using steroids and tocilizumab, etc. But if you come in late, you know, um, that makes it really difficult. So again, um, uh, resulting in, in higher uh, death rates. And then number three, I think um, the fact that we as a country have high rates of diabetes and, and obesity also didn't help because even young people who were overweight and uh, having diabetes progressed to severe disease very quickly. And number four, of course, the vulnerable uh, groups, uh, migrant workers, prisons had huge outbreaks on top of a pandemic. Um, people living in very congested uh, multi-generational households uh, like the PPR flats and so forth. So all these factors, I think, collided to make us have a very severe uh, Delta surge between July and, and October. So, you know, as the vaccination program came in um, around about September, then we started seeing the numbers come down. The numbers came down as people, more people got infected and naturally that's how epidemics work anyway. So it was a combination of natural infection and, and, and as the vaccine coverage increased, the numbers came down. So 
to say that we're not ready for endemicity, well, I, I think, you know, we, we know where our weaknesses were, are, and uh, we, we should, um, and I believe Ministry of Health, you know, is in the process of uh, um, addressing all those uh, reasons why we had such a bad time. Um, and to me, central would be to equip the uh, PKD so that we can detect cases, isolate them, uh, et cetera, et cetera, as quickly as possible, because the key is to break the chain, right? Yes. And we need to protect the vulnerable people, people in nursing homes, uh, make, make those who are at high risk of getting severe disease aware of uh, their risk and maybe, you know, avoid crowded places and so forth. And of course, to strengthen the primary care uh, component. So, because they're the front lines that, you know, after the public health people have identified, et cetera, they'll be home monitored and, uh, you know, told what to do to and not delay, you know, if, if, if they belong to risk groups uh, and have symptoms, not delay going to hospital. So, um, you know, I, I on, on the, socioeconomic side we also observe uh, you know um, huge impact the pandemic has had on on businesses on individuals and particularly those that are related to the tourism sector so uh, in in all shapes and form and hotels etc so i i i think we should capitalize on our very high vaccination rate much much more um because that, that in a way that's the whole point right yes we we should i i know that people are starting to get very nervous because the numbers have gone up again but at this stage we should be watching the rate of hospitalization and icu rates and and mortality rates instead of being too obsessed with the numbers, because our testing uh, has improved tremendously. So people are testing themselves very often with, with rapid tests and report that. And, you know, so even if the cases are mild, it gets reported. So the, the main idea is not to get the health systems overwhelmed. Um, and so we, we need to watch the hospitalization, as I said, the hospitalization rate, the ICU rate, and I think most importantly is to get the public to to take control of their own health and their own risk, right? I think two and a half years of, of the pandemic, we should all know how it it's how you get infected, how it's transmitted, that the test kits, thank goodness, have been made much more available and cheaply. Believe, so if, believe me, yeah. believe me, Prof. After two and a half years, there are still people who are very resistant. I see that. I see that. In, I see. I see that in church every Sunday. You know, people who just just want to retaliate or you know, uh, and not not adhere to just simple instructions. No, but just coming back to uh, pandemic back, fatigue is the real thing. Yeah. Yeah. True. Coming back to what you were saying earlier, and, and of course, we, we are, people will be waiting to ask you about booster shot, and we will ask you how many times we, do we need to be boosted. But before we go to that, and I think you pointed out rightly. Uh, we are getting obsessed with the number of infections uh, at this point, and, and you see the numbers going up. Uh, and rightly, you said that we should be looking at number of hospitalizations and, and people in ICU or even even deaths. Uh, maybe that is a better indicator of, of where we are. Uh, despite these things, I just want you to know: to move to an to an to an, to an endemic state, uh, what 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 would be some of the the baselines or what, what would be the prerequisites? Uh, we are we are still talking about pandemic to move to that stage uh, and to coexist. Uh, what would we have to? Uh, what would be the requirements like? Yeah, I think to the the numbers will have to be at a uh, constant where the health system is able to to cope. You know, just like it is with dengue. Um, to undeclare a pandemic can only be done by. Um, the WHO, but you know maybe it's better that you know rather than call it endemic pandemic for now for Malaysia we 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 should start the other common phrase that's used is to learn to live with the virus, 
right? I think practically for, for us as individuals, families and, and, and communities, that's probably more practical too, to really learn how to live with the virus. You know, um, a few months ago, someone called me from UK, no, no less, a Malaysian who was in the UK and said, hey, Adiba, do you think I should go to this football match? You know, the UK was having such a big, uh, you know, huge number of cases, and um, he's he's vaccinated, boosted, and desperately wants to go to this football match. And I say, well, first of all, you've vaccinated, you boosted the chance of you, and and you don't, ha you're not at high risk of getting severe disease. But um, uh, but uh, you know, the the the, num the 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 risk of getting infected is reasonably high, even though it's an outdoor game. But you know. The stadium, as you walk into the stadium, is going to be very crowded. People in the UK are not very good with wearing their masks, not like in Malaysia. Um, so it boils down to how much risk are you willing to accept um, to go and watch this important football game versus watching it on TV, right? Um, so I think those are the kinds of uh, risk assessment that, that we all need to make you know take control of your own um uh, destiny if you like yeah. <laughs> it must, it, it must have been a very important football match for him to go want to go <laughs> Correct. I mean, for, for instance then let's take it to chinese new year you know yeah. um a very important uh, occasion families have missed two chinese new years reunion dinners etc You've got an elderly mother or grandmother at the house at the reunion. Now, what can we do? You know, um, make sure everybody's been vaccinated, had their booster. You can easily do a, a rapid test on the day of the reunion um, or, or two days in a row because the rapid test um, is very good at picking up when you're in highly infectious. So if you are negative a couple of days in a row, the chances are you are going to be negative, right? And open the windows, open the windows, turn off the aircon, turn on the fans, open the windows, or better still, have the makan outdoors, um, and not have too many people, you know, uh, hopefully your family is not too big. And, uh, you know, I think, I think, that to me is how we start living with with the virus um you know do the things that are important um but minimize the risk prof the elephant the elephant in the room how many times do we need to get boosted that's what everybody <laughs> yes. wants yeah, yeah so let me let me go back to the basis basics of the boosters first um so around 56 percent of malaysians have had the mrna um the, the, the Pfizer vaccine, about 30% um, Sinovac, and the rest are AstraZeneca and, and very, very small percentage have had the CanSino. Now, the reason, f I mean, the, the mRNA vaccines in, in particular, as well as the AstraZeneca vaccine, are very, very effective vaccines. But what we saw, at least uh, in countries where they vaccinated people earlier, for instance, Israel and, and UK and, and the US, was that the antibodies were starting to wane after, meaning go down after six months or so. And hence, you know, the concern about the Omicron and, and the boosters. Um, so when the third dose was given, the antibodies shot up and now we see that yes it's providing um, very good protection against severe disease so the no question about needing that booster dose um i should say that for those who had the inactivated the, the sinovac vaccine the third dose in my mind and in a lot of other infectious disease and, and, and vaccine experts, that third dose is still not a booster if you are taking a third dose of Sinovac. That is considered a primary vaccine because it's a less efficacious vaccine. And it, this is not unusual. The uh, hepatitis B vaccine is a three-dose vaccine. So for me, I think for those who choose to take Sinovac, 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 your, your booster is only going to be the fourth dose, right? And we did a study to show that people who had Sinovac have higher risk of um, severe disease and death. Um, 
So the sign of those who have had Sinovac should should take a, a, a fourth dose. Um, for those who have had the um, mRNA vaccines or the AstraZeneca vaccine plus an mRNA, the common wisdom is that that should be enough for now because for, for two reasons. The antibodies are not the only um, uh, part within us, the immune system that uh, is there to protect us against severe disease. It's a very complex system in, thank goodness, um, uh, that, that exists within us, that the, the vaccines also um, teach or train what's called T cells. Um, so memory T cells, which in future, if it encounters the virus again, will kick into gear. And, and you know, lab studies have shown that these vaccines also work, I mean, also have prime the T cells. So I think there's a, a large group of scientists who, who don't think that we need to keep boosting for now because we've got the, the memory T cells as well as the B cells and neutralizing antibodies, a whole gamut of things that should have been primed. The other reason for not sort of boosting uh, every time is, of course, there's a whole continent mm -hmm. where 90% of people have not received their even first dose, right? Um, so I think uh, we, we really need to balance uh, that. But yeah. you know, this virus keeps uh, surprising us. Um, we, we, you know, it's, it's not going to be a no, we're never going to need it uh, answer. We, we, there's still so much that we don't know that, you know, we just need to keep watching, doing the research, following the signs. So I think, I think uh, Prof, just, just to stay on vaccines a little bit, uh, you know, we are, we are going into vaccinating children. Some thoughts on that, uh, Prof, uh, five, uh, those 5 to yeah, 11. Yeah, this has been a, a hot debate, right? Um, first of all, um, the, the evidence for vaccinating children is very clear in terms of the need. Um, it's, it's not uh, a, a, a mild disease in children. Yes, it's not as severe, you know, severe as it has been in adults, but then again, it's not necessarily like just a cold because children can, you know, children may even get long COVID and you don't want millions of children to have yeah. kind of this long COVID um, complications. And secondly, although the vaccine's not perfect in terms of reducing transmission, there's evidence that it does uh, do that as well. Um, and thirdly, the safety of this vaccine is also very clear. Um, the US just released a report on, because they, this is the most surveyed, most watched vaccine program ever in the world, you know, whether it's the US, UK or Europeans have been doing the surveillance. The US released a, um, a report on the vac on their vaccine program in children. And they this was a couple of weeks ago where more than 8 million children between the ages of 5 and 11 have been vaccinated. And I think 12 12 out of 8 million had um, serious complications of the myocarditis. So, you know, no vaccine is 100% safe, but this vaccine is not only really efficacious, but it's also, you know, um, safe. They, they are getting a, a lesser dose than the adults, right? For yes, children. yes, yes. It's a, it's a, a childhood Point formulation. Two. Yeah. Wow, I think I think you know, Prof. You mentioned a little bit about vaccine, and earlier on, you touch about how there is a whole continent of people that have yet to be vaccinated, even for the first dose. And you were recently talking a little bit about vaccine nationalism, and you were quite vocal about it. Um, can you share with our viewers what do you mean by that? And um, is there anything that WHO or world bodies are actually doing something about it? Yeah. So you know, and and. Uh, learning from the lessons of, of HIV AIDS, right? I, I 
had to do a few talks on the lessons of the two pandemic, um, COVID-19 and, and HIV, and was reviewing some of the history of, of HIV. Um, let me just take a few minutes to reflect on that and, and why I'm, I'm also quite passionate about this COVID vaccine nationalism. When the um, effective treatment for HIV um, was, was discovered, in 1997, 1998, the so-called HART, highly active antiretroviral therapy, literally only people in the rich world could afford it. I recall in Malaysia, only my rich patients could afford to pay 2,800 ringgit a month. And the others we were, we were watching um, die, you know, because we, we couldn't get our hands on, on these drugs. And it took uh, another four years, and when 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 the IAS hosted um, the Durban conference in the year 2000 in Durban, and Nelson Mandela spoke at it, that the world kind of galvanized and said, "You can't have, you know, treatment for a life-saving treatment in in the rich world, and you know, entire continents are dying." And uh, <clears throat> and at the time, you know, in South Africa alone, that three, that four, five year delay of um, having access to uh, affordable treatment, it was calculated that something like three hundred and fifty thousand people died. That's just in South Africa, and you know, the pandemic was is huge in in Africa, right? And something like 35,000 babies were born with HIV just in that four years when they couldn't access this expensive treatment because, of course, treatment also prevents mother-to-child transmission for HIV. And yet now, you know, we're watching it happen all over again uh, around the world. Um, you know, uh, where, whereas the US uh, and the UK and everyone and even us talking about how many boosters do we need, the vaccines are not reaching um, to the rest of the world, um, and particularly in Africa. And what it means is that, you know, we've really seen it with the Omicron. If, if people are not vaccinated, you're going to have, you know, infections. Viruses love uh, being able to infect more people because that's what it does. And, and when it infects, it mutates. Uh, and so the risk of mutation is, is going to continue. Um, and, you know, no matter how hard we close borders, it is going to get in, right? Because by the time we know about it, it's already entered. Case in point yes. was Malaysia. By the time we detected the first Omicron in Malaysia in November, she had already been in the country for two weeks. So, you know, um, sorry, but the virus is so much more clever than us. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. Talking about closing borders, uh, Prof. I mean, I mean, I, I'm sure a lot of people are just dying to get out uh, wherever. <laughs> I mean, even if it's just state borders or, or anywhere. Um, how, how do we how do we navigate how long do we close our borders i, I think a few countries are very strict at, the, at, at right at this moment australia is one uh, i know hong kong is another one that's got very strict border controls i'm not too sure i think, I think china too uh, yeah. how long how, how long do we continue like this people cannot travel yeah, and, and it's decimated the entire uh, airline industry and downstream the hotels and and everything you know uh, just some, some personal anecdote a couple of weeks ago i went to the Kraft Tangan place in Jalan Conley to get a gift for a friend who's leaving, a, 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 a foreigner who's leaving. And the place was dead, you know, dead. My husband and I, this was on a Sunday afternoon, were the only two people at the place. And, and when you think of all that downstream uh, uh, impact, you know, the, 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 the machis who are making the bath yeah. dates and the people in Sarawak making the beautiful rotan baskets and all that how long is it going to take to recover from all this you know um and so you know I, I'm, I'm speaking as as a doctor and i too don't want to have to manage more patients again but then there needs to be a balance and i think you know we've got this test now we've got this amazing test although it's not perfect the the rapid antigen but i think you know if, if, if we test them if we get people to test frequently um, and uh, you know isolate as appropriately, I, I, I feel that you know we, we should be ready to move on pretty soon. 
Well, I Hopefully. think that's, that's one, one, one of the realities. Such a high vaccine coverage, you know. That's one of the realities that we are struggling with to, to weigh the, the risk of, of COVID infections uh, spreading uh, between uh, the risk of losing livelihoods, uh, yeah. trying, to, trying to manage this too. Uh, I don't envy whoever is in that position to having to make those decisions. Of course, it's, it's uh, tough, right? But, yeah. you know, we, we, I mean, the vaccines, the vaccines have really really turned things around and then of course we have now got treatment right we we know what to do uh, for severe disease but um there's also early treatment now that's become that there's a the pfizer drug called paxlovid the merck drug is not so good unfortunately with the pfizer drug um <clears throat> uh, because they're the only one producing i think there's going to be a, a, a delay in production and, and you know, getting to us, the Americans will want it first. Um, but um, we, 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 Minister of Health and colleagues from Ministry of Health and I are going to do a, uh, a research on a, a repurposed drug. It's not ivermectin um, that has shown a lot of promise. And hopefully after Chinese New Year, we will be able to do this. Um, so, you know, aiming to treat people early, well, best of all, is testing, you know, as frequently as possible if you've been exposed, if you have symptoms, and if so, isolate yourself. And if your symptoms uh, or you're at risk, um, perhaps uh, uh, we, we give you this treatment. And coming to hospital early because there is effective treatment with steroids, with um, what's called tocilizumab to prevent this progression. We, we know now how to manage this disease a lot, lot better. So putting all those things together, I think, and, and plus, of course, the high vaccine coverage and uh, booster, I think we need to be more confident moving forward because the damage, you know, like what I've observed to the airline industry, to, to my colleagues um, in the FMB and hotel uh, industry, and like I said, the downstream small, um, uh, you know the, the people the mom and pop shops yeah yeah and crafts for a living it's just too great and it's going to take them years to recover Prof, you are also in the, in the scientific uh, committee in, in, in who and you talk about uh, accessibility for example the antiviral drugs are like for example you're talking about the pfizer we don't have enough production uh, is there a talk like for example like you know of course, there's also the, the element of the economics of it all uh, and, and the monopoly of, of, of the, the drug. Uh, is there a talk or are you all like lobbying for, for the, if I may, I don't know if I'm using the right word, the patent for those kind of drugs um, be available to yeah. others to yeah. produce it so that more people get it? Is, is there some kind of talk in, in, at that level for you? Sure. Um, I, so WHO is a very big organization. The Science Council that I belong to has a very specific uh, TOR, and that's to advise the Director General on specific issues. Um, for now, we have chosen to uh, just look at the importance of genomics in the, the science on, of genomics, the applicability of genomic science uh, for diagnostics, for treatment, etc. So it's a very, very focused uh, piece of work, and we'll be, hopefully be producing the report very soon. We're working very hard on, on this. Um, but there's also different uh, arms of WHO and, and others that have been discussing on the possibility of having a pandemic treaty to, um, you know, look at things uh, to do with um, patents um, and uh, sharing of data around the world, etc., uh, etc. Et so, yeah, it's unfortunate that COVAX, I mean, when the pandemic um, happened, uh, that there was very early prediction that something like this was going to happen in terms of, you know, um, uh, low-income countries may not be able to access um, the vaccines. And so the, the, the vehicle COVAX was uh, put together, which was to really address uh, this problem and try and get you know, uh, vaccines at a lower price and um, coordinate all the 
supply chain and procurement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the amount of money uh, that was put into Covax was not um, as much as was hoped. So it's it's struggling, but it's it's trying to to do as much as possible. Now the exciting, the recent exciting thing is the. Um, uh, a, a famous vaccine um, scientist, doctor, and 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 a guy who's made um, <clears throat> his career on focusing on uh, neglected diseases, Dr. Peter Hortez from uh, Baylor College in Texas. He and his colleagues have um, designed a vaccine, not an mRNA vaccine, but uh, I think it's an inactivated vaccine, and has not put a patent to it. So hopefully that will uh, be able to be uh, produced and uh, used by countries that have trouble accessing uh, the more you know sophisticated vaccines um, dr salk who invented the polio vaccine when asked how come you didn't patent the vaccine said how can you patent the sun right mm. yeah <laughs> It, 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 it's actually very interesting, Professor, that you brought this up because earlier on you touched a little bit about how we will be living with the virus and in, in for, for for some future to come. And, you know, with the Chinese New Year around the corner, you've actually shared some tips for our viewers. And we've also got a question coming in about, you know, if I had these two doses of Sinovac and, and then my third one, which is the booster, which is a Pfizer, is that my, my does it consider as my first dose or is that actually a booster dose? Um, you know, there's so much question around that. Maybe you can help our viewers just to clarify a little bit about how do we view again the, the the two shots of vaccine and the booster, especially when it comes to the younger ones, because they will be also most likely getting their booster. Yeah. So um, the the um, to be honest, the the booster, um, like, like I said, it's it's two doses plus one for the mRNA and AZ vaccines. Now, there, there are studies, but not as much of the Sinovac uh, plus the mRNA, and, and um, uh, possibly that's enough um, uh, for now. Um, the, in, in terms of younger people, there is, there is debate whether they should receive the booster or not. Um, you know, the WHO and, and others say that you should really only res do the boosting in those over 65, those who are immunocompromised, uh, those who have not had um, adequate response because they're, they're immunocompromised for whatever reason. Um, I think, uh, you know, uh, the, we, we are boosting um, adults and adolescents um, and um, yeah I, for children I, I don't know I don't think um, we have any uh, signs to guide us but possibly not okay. and you know that staying on on the topic of the virus and all what are what are the the, the science council or, or, or your team of experts talk about in terms of the variants and the different possibility of mutations, do we see more of that coming along? Because some countries, you know, have lesser vaccination rate and, and that drives the mutation of, of the virus. Is that is that how it will be? That, that is always a, a cause for concern, right? Because that's what viruses do. So that if they have the, if we, you know, the, there's still a lot, large number of people who um, are potentially uh, going to become infectious, then yes, um, or, be, or be, can be infected, then yes, the as the virus, um, uh, you know, infects people, they, they and breed, they mutate. Um, and so that is a concern. So hence the importance of vaccinating the world. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm concerned because I think, you know, the Greek letters eventually run out at some point and, and, and because all the variants and variants of concerns and all that becomes, gets turned into a, a Greek letter, you know, my, my hope is that we don't actually end up running out of Greek letters to, to name those variants. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think yes. when, when you talk about equitable distribution of, of, of resources, and I think that's one thing that the Pope has also been advocating 
uh, when recently when he he spoke to the all the the diplomats who were sent to to the Vatican, and that's what he was saying. Uh, though he says that you know health is is a it's a moral obligation. Everyone needs to protect themselves, and also there's an obligation to protect the other. Uh, and sometimes people don't don't see that that fact when the fact that they. As, as you said, I mean, vaccine hesitancy is still there after more than a year, uh, and it's quite real, because in, in churches yeah. I also see that, and people sometimes say that, you know, oh, your church, uh, you know, you're not, you, you're not compassionate towards us, you know, you you are discriminating. The, the word used even is, is like you're discriminating us from entering the church. But I've also had people saying, say, they say, Father, when I come to church, I, I want to be sure that the person I'm sitting next to is vaccinated. You know, I, I want that assurance, but sometimes I, I really struggle with the fact that how do I give you that assurance, uh, stopping short of, you know, uh, literally asking them, show me your, I mean, technically you have to, to be vaccinated to enter into a place of worship here. So this whole idea of equitable distribution, vaccine hesitancy, I, I'm just wondering, Prof, if, and, and I pray that we will conquer this this COVID-19 uh, soon, what, what lessons have we learned you know, from, from your expertise and what stories would you like to tell, you know, future students, medical graduates, what have we learned? I mean, I mean none of us lived through the Spanish flu, I'm sure, and, and I'm sure you have read many stories about the Spanish flu and what, what lessons have we learned and uh, to prevent an outbreak like this to happen ever again in the history of yeah. humanity? Yeah, for sure, for sure, Father. And I think, you know, uh, all nations around the world need to kind of uh, take a step back, learn what, what happened um, and uh, be prepared for the next one because all the, um, you know, the computer, computational biologists and, and virology experts and, and pathogen experts around the world say that, you know, this is not going to be the last one. And again, in the last, uh, you know, since the Nipah, our very own Nipah outbreak in 1997, we've had so many new um, new diseases, right? So after Nipah, we had SARS, after SARS, we had MERS, after MERS, we had Ebola, Zika, um, and now SARS-CoV-2. So what uh, lessons must we learn? Number one is, you know, all those diseases that I have just um, uh, mentioned have been what we call zoonotic disease coming from animals to men. So for as long as we encroach into the animal kingdom, into nature and all that, this is going to continue to happen. So we've got to be serious about, you know, respecting um, you know, the nature and, and work with veterinarians and environmentalists, etc., to kind of um, uh, address this, you know, the mobility uh, around the world, uh, although I, I, I feel very sorry for the travel industry, but that also um, uh, gave rise to, to the pandemics, right, the ease by which uh, pathogens travel. The animal, the, the 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 illegal animal trade and illegal plant trades are making it easy for for pathogens around, you know, to travel around the world. So, I think first of all, um, uh, at the global level, um, these things need to be addressed. <clears throat> and then, of course, um, in country, um, like I said, one of the reasons why we had such a terrible um, outbreak or, or, you know, terrible rate uh, of cases and, and deaths was the public health system was unprepared for the sheer number of cases that we had. And for as long as our government um, continues to underfund the public health system, and when I say the public health system, it means that there's a public health discipline, the PKDs and all that's a public health discipline, but also the public health Hospitals like mine, like Hospital Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, the, the public health hospitals, we chronically underinvested, not enough, you know, senior people and, and you know, the, the move towards privatization of healthcare was not a very good decision. I think it kind of, um, but it's too late to, to pull back. So now we need to figure out how the public and private system systems can work together. The second thing about 
um, uh, locally is, of course, uh, you know, I think if there was one lesson that needs to be learned, it's the importance of digitization. We, we, we really need to respond quickly. Um, and so, first of all, to have a good surveillance system in place so that, you know, we recognize when there are outbreaks, when there are a few cases in a certain area that, hey, there's something going on there, let's act on it quickly and not let it kind of uh, explode. So having a good surveillance system is very important. And as part of that, I think uh, it should be enabled by digital technology. Yes, the investment is going to be high, but look at what, what you know, this, this pandemic has cost us financially. Um, and thirdly, I think uh, what we've not had enough time to talk about is, of course, whether it's HIV or whether it's uh, COVID, it's the poor, the vulnerable, the marginalized that get impacted the most, right? Um, uh, staying at home for you, me, may not be such an ordeal, but for someone who needs to earn his living um, and has to go out to work and exposes himself to infection, it's a big deal, right? Uh, because he can't stay at home, he has to go to work and, and, and living. You and I can zoom and you know carry out our, our work well i couldn't because i had to go to hospital but you, you know what i mean so it, it's it's in the end it's the poor marginalized and the migrant workers the prisons um so for malaysia i think we need to seriously address those things um you know the 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 uh, the, out, the sheer number of cases uh, amongst migrant workers because they were living in terrible conditions that was just ripe for uh, the infections to pass. I, I don't think that root cause has been um, has been addressed. Refugees, you know, um, in, in, in detention centers. And of course, uh, my own area of interest is in prison. We we, you know, worked with some parliamentarians around uh, advocating for early release uh, of prisoners uh, at the time of the pandemic. That Sri Azalina and uh, YB Nurul Iza and and uh, Datin Sri Rohani and a few very concerned members of parliament, but we were only able to get that, you know, so far. Many countries actually um, released the prisoners early, and and now that we know, um, I mean. Uh, you know, whether it's TB or whether it's COVID, you know, we, 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 we're putting in people in prison for very minor crimes. And, you know, I, well, you'd have to invite me to talk about this. Uh, another <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, 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 get, you, um, you, you get yeah. sentenced now uh, even for stealing food to survive through this pandemic. Uh, yeah, you know, yes. to be kind of like yeah. inhumane. Prof, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to put you in a spot uh, uh, and, yeah, in a sense that, uh, is Malaysia ready to to move to, to a pandemic stage? And if we are, uh, what kind of SOPs do you think we are looking at uh, in an endemic state? So I think, you know, I think we, we, we have um, done tremendously well in terms of the vaccination. We need to feel um, a, a little bit more confident than we are at the moment. So that's number one. We, we're nearly there. Uh, well, we are there, I think, with the vaccination coverage. Protect the, the most vulnerable and secondly, clear, concise communication to the public is going to be very important. And it's not just, you know, uh, with your audience educated and, and know how to risk manage and risk assess, but also for people who don't speak English or, or who may not be um, uh, so, so well versed about what's going on. I think we need to tailor our communication, so avoid crowded places. Uh, we need to continue. I, I, I foresee that we probably need to continue masking for a while until globally things settle down. But indoors, you know, it should be safe mm -hmm. to, to unmask outdoors unless it's in crowded places. Ventilation. Um, so those kinds of things need to be drummed into people all, uh, all the time and, and empower people to take responsibility for their own health. But you, you're right, Father, because, um, you know, those who are vaccine hesitant, um, we need to reach out to them and understand what, what is it that's um, that's causing uh, this hesitancy, particularly those who've not even had the first dose or second dose. Yeah. 
Yeah. So wow. uh, I think there's still a lot of work to be done, but when you consider the the economic impact um, that border closure and and uh, you know tourism uh, has had, uh, maybe we just need to uh, you know take take a step forward a little bit more confidently um, and have the systems in place for surveillance as well as early detection with testing. We already have that the testing. Um, and follow up. Just, just listening to you, Prof. Uh, you know, I just the the the, con the confidence with which you speak, yes. I mean, knowing the subject matter. But you are convinced that that we are there. We are almost there. You know, it gives me a great assurance uh, that we kind of have this in control uh, to to a certain extent. And I think hearing it from you, uh, an expert, uh, is is very reassuring uh, because we read many things, and many things get forwarded via you know social media sure. and, and, and i think, watch... I think yeah. people also read a lot from from overseas right and and every country is is different you know although america you know have loads of vaccines but 40 percent of their people are unvaccinated or some mm -hmm. huge number like that and and you know they're, they're great articles showing how those in the red states are the ones that are having problem the the republican states you know who are not vaccinated ICUs are overflowing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, some some of that um, information and knowledge need to be, um, and, and we have this uh, mantra in the HIV world: know your epidemic, know your response. So we cannot take what's happening in in the US as what's going to happen in Malaysia because we, our vaccine uh, status is is quite different. You know, I, I think I came in this morning, you know, with with some kind of hesitation. I still still Same you know, the kind of little cut of fear. But just listening to you, I, I feel so so reassured. Uh, you know, it's Thank so to, to know where we are in terms of in Malaysia at least. I mean, it, like you said, leave aside what's happening in the UK or what's happening in the US or other parts. Uh, it's so reassuring. You people don't wear masks. You know, I yeah, was in the right. UK in uh, in late. September, October, and I thought, oh my God, you know, I've, I've, I've been working in, in COVID, uh, in the COVID ward, looking after COVID patients. I'm triply vaccinated. I went into the tube and I, I said to my two sons, we're the only ones with masks here, typical exactly. Asians. You know, and like, I'm, I'm going to get, you know, I, and thankfully I didn't, but I said, I'm going to get infected in London after, you know, working two years in a COVID ward. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's exactly what what my, my niece said when she came back said you know she, she's the only one who wears she's asian and everybody looks at them kind of strangely why are you mm -hmm. wearing a mask and the rest of us especially Prof, in the um, tube where it's so you know congested yeah. and poor ventilation uh, we, we are we are coming to an end to our conversation this interesting conversation which we can go on actually but uh, i just want to address uh one one particular issue because we are getting into this vaccination of children and there are many parents who are still very hesitant uh, what would your your advice be to parents who are hesitant uh, to have their children vaccinated? You know, um, I, I would advise that they get you know, straight. If, if, if my children were that age group, I would get them vaccinated. Mine are quite old now. Um, and we have vaccinated our children with so many, many other vaccines, right? The BCG is actually a live vaccine. For example, these these are not live vaccines even, um, and like I said, eight million doses, eight million children have been vaccinated in the U.S. Um, and in a vaccine program that's been the most scrutinized ever uh, in the world, U.K., U.S., uh, E.U. have been surveying post-vaccine, um, and twelve. 12 children have had serious adverse events. Of course, if you are that the parent of that one child with a serious event, you are going, you're never going to forgive yourself, right? But, you know, on the whole, um, it is a safe vaccine. 12 out of 8 million. Yeah. Um, and it, it's a vaccine that will protect your child from hopefully getting long, from getting infection and it's not like i said it's not a benign disease there's this thing called um, um multi-inflammatory syndrome they, there's potential for long COVID. there's um 
And most importantly, we need to get children back to school. Yes. You know, I think the yeah. biggest uh, impact of the pandemic in children is probably the two years of non-schooling um, and which with its own uh, problems, right? Behavioral, uh, academic achievement, um, the ability, you know, uh, de depressions, uh, in, you know, all sorts of things. Uh, so, and, and any pediatric organization, association in the world all say we need to get children back to school. And so the vaccine uh, is, is also for that. Yeah. You are so right, Prof. I was, I was just speaking to a, a school teacher yesterday, and you know, they were saying to me that uh, year one students this year, when they come to school, they are having to do remedial work, uh, things that they should have done in preschool. Mm. These two years they did not go to preschool, so mm -hmm. they are doing it at year one. Uh, so that's kind of impeded their progress, and not just intellectually, uh, like you said, uh, emotionally, psychologically, the, the usual developmental stages of a children yeah. uh, they have been yeah. impeded. Uh, Prof, uh, we are so grateful to be able to have to have had this conversation with you this morning. I will not hold you much longer. I'm sure you have a, a, a list of things to, to do. I've got to go to a wedding too, but I don't have to preside over that wedding. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, you don't have to I'll do that. Thank yourself, uh, uh, we, we, are, we are truly uh, grateful, uh, firstly, My to pleasure. the work that you do. Of I've heard you speak on, on many platforms, this, this conscientizing people. And I think that has to continue uh, in talking to people in this way. So we are truly grateful for the work that you do. Uh, okay. We wish you all the best. Wish wish you God's blessings and also protection and safety, uh, especially in this area of infectious diseases. Uh, I'm sure uh, you need extra help uh, help from above uh, to watch over you when you Always. do work like this. <laughs> JP, over to you, JP. Yeah, Professor. You know, again, sharing just what Father Clarence said when I was just preparing the notes, I was thinking, oh my gosh, this is like preparing questions for a doomsday conversation. But, you know, thankfully, we have you in our show. And I think our audience are also very grateful that they tune into this program, because you're able to provide this very clear communication, clear strategy, and being able to articulate where we are. And so, you know, at the end of the show, I'm coming out feeling, actually, you know what, Malaysians, we should be proud of ourselves because we are, we are at this, we are at this stage. Yeah. yeah. But you know we won't be able to get it done without the help of infectious specialists like yourself and and you know a team behind you who i'm sure is working tirelessly as we speak right it's now the ministry of health yeah. I think that, that a lot of credit also needs to go to yeah all the same wishing you safe travels uh professor wherever you are heading to this year for your conferences um i'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more from you in the media in the news and all that um just you know wishing you all the best and thank you so much for coming on to our show today it's a pleasure thank you Thank you. Have a good weekend. Yeah, let's. We, we usually conclude with a prayer, uh, Prof. If you don't mind, we will just say a prayer to okay. conclude and ask God to bless all of us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this conversation uh, that you offer this opportunity for us to clarify our doubts, our hesitancies, and also where we are headed. We thank you for people like Prof. Adiba and so many other people who tires, tirelessly have worked, especially in these last two years, in containing this pandemic and offering hope. Uh, for many people from young to old we pray that you will protect them in the work that they do bless their hands to uh, bless each one of us protect us as we move forward we ask you to be with us to lead us and to guide us we pray all this in jesus name amen, amen. thank you everyone and thank happy you, chinese everyone. new year uh, jp and to all our viewers and happy yes. holidays to the rest Enjoy the Hello, safe everyone. Kong si Fatai. Be safe. Make sure that you've got your fan, your window, everything is proper, and uh, and uh, do the right right risk assessment. Do your your self test before you head home for this new year. Wishing everyone all the best. Take care. <laughs>